I'm speaking with Christopher Sperandio. He is an artist who's done a lot of very interesting work in the worlds of uh, fine art, comics, and illustration. And uh, not everyone can say that. And I think that those worlds are very different. People aren't necessarily talking to each other. And so we'll, we'll just uh, jump in, uh, Christopher. Uh, thank you so much for, for participating in this. Sure, thanks for having me. So, uh, that is my, I've got like three main talking points or, or, or questions to ask you. And one of them is the worlds of illustration, comics, fine art. They're so different. And you've yeah. been part of all three. Uh, I think that you have like a very special self-awareness that uh, might elude a lot of folks in, in these three worlds. Well, I, I, um, I went to art school and they really tried to beat comic books out of me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it just wouldn't take. I was, uh, I was, uh, I just went underground with my love of comics. And so, you know, when I went to art school, um, I made a decision, which a smart decision, which is kind of rare for me to make a smart decision, but I made a decision that I would listen to my professors. And now being a, a teacher myself, I know that that's not always the case with students. And so what I decided is that I thought that, you know, these, the faculty, the people teaching me painting and drawing and printmaking, they, they know things that I don't know. I'm, I was from a small town in Appalachia. You know, I, I uh, didn't have a, a lot of experience with the world. And so I let them teach me. And so I learned, I knew about comics from growing up with comics. That was really the only culture that was available to me, that in television. And uh, two movies a week came to my town in the 70s. Um, and so, uh, so I knew comics, but I didn't know color theory and I didn't know the modernist painting. And so I learned all of that um, sort of on purpose uh, before um jumping back into comics well this is a, a super treat for me we're both uh, the same generation we're both of the same outlook in a lot of ways i think uh, gen xers this is like a, a broad generalization but i think they took things a little more seriously they loved novels they wanted to write novels they wanted to do paintings they wanted to follow the rules to some extent also be rebellious but uh, it seems like we were willing to go the extra mile. It wasn't, there was no internet, of course. Everyone talks about that, but it seems like that generation uh, uh, was a little more self-conscious, a little more, am I following the rules correctly? And, and is, the new generation is more like, can you just hand it over to me? Let's get on to the next thing. In, in general, just being a little tongue in cheek there. Yeah, I mean, I, um... I uh, I don't know how I would characterize. I guess because I'm surrounded by young people all the time, and 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 they are forever young, and I am just getting older all the time. I try to, I I try to hear them. You know, I don't know if they're hearing me, but I try to hear them, and uh, and so, um, you know, also. Uh, I don't think that I'm the teacher my teachers were. I, I, I don't know that I'm, uh, I'm sure I'm making mistakes with my students, but, uh, but I, I certainly try to get them to hear my position. I know that they, they love manga, for instance. My students, the students who come to me to take my comics class are, were raised in, on manga. I can't stand manga. It's a generational thing. I don't know about you. Are you a manga fan? Well, I'm open to it. And uh, there are certainly the masters of, of manga who I respect, but it's not something I would naturally go to. It's not like I'm looking specific. Oh yeah, let's, I'm, a, I'm not a, a hard follower of that. Yeah, yeah, me either. And so, uh, you know, so already there's this huge chasm between my students and me. Um, you know, I think, I think I'm talking their language. Maybe I'm not, but, I, you know, teaching, teaching and making, 
they kind of go hand in hand. You know, I don't know that that the work that I'm making, you know, hits all the time either, right? I mean, anything that we do, it's kind of a crapshoot. I think you're probably doing a wonderful <laughs> job. I, 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 uh, I think artists. This was all an elaborate chat, so you <laughs> give me a nice compliment about uh, some. Well, artists are very. Yet. Artists are very self-deprecating, and so we have to be careful. We have to give ourselves our, our due as well. But let me jump into uh, this uh, sort of like a slideshow. We can have fun with that. Okay. Now, I, I'm so curious about this because this is like where you began. Yeah. And it's a bunch of, of chocolate bars. And uh, it brings me to uh, to that question that I started to ask. Uh, well, I asked you about the the worlds of illustration, comics, and fine art, but you seem to be like a purist. You've always wanted to, to do something that, that without compromise, is that like a good, is that fair to say? Yeah, uh, or I'm hard headed. That's another, another way to say it. <laughs> yeah, this is the We Got It uh, uh, chocolate bar project. And it was, it was for a, a kind of a groundbreaking exhibition that happened in Chicago in 1993. And um, I have a, a, a collaborative partner that I, I still work with on occasion. Uh, and we did this project together where we, um, you know, we really, it may, if you're a comic book fan, it may be hard to follow the logic, how, how, this, is a, how this is an important artwork. Uh, it's just some candy bars, right? So, so the idea was that we wanted to make a monument to labor using the, the thing that they make as the monument, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, we wanted to work with a chocolate bar uh, union or chocolate making union, which we did. And, uh, and we got them involved, we got the union involved in the design process. So the, the, the colors, the, the typography, the, the, even the name of it was made as part of a committee and you can kind of see us all there on this point of sale box. And so it's an unusual artwork uh, for its time and even, even today, it's a, it's a weird thing to have done. Yeah, it's like totally anti what you'd expect, a subversive, a not glamorous, not uh, uh, appealing in the marketable traditional marketable sense. Yeah. I, I, I will just go through these as quickly or as slowly as, as we like. Uh, okay. So here's where you where you enter into the comic book world with, with your, uh, I, I imagine you're already partnered up with, you, with your uh, the comic book partner, Grennan? Yeah, yeah, Simon Grennan, who actually, um, uh, you know, he's uh, gone really heavily into comics now as well. He has a PhD and has done a bunch of comics research and produced uh, uh, graphic novels. It's, uh, um, you know, he's still, he's still really active in that field. Yeah, this is, uh, we began making comics um, the th with the Candy Bar project. People didn't trust our voice as artists because we were involving other people in the project and there was nothing that anybody could necessarily point to and it's a very old fashioned kind of notion, like what did you do on this? What part did you have a play hand, hand in? So uh, I thought that comics would be a good place where we could um, involve other people, tell other people's stories. And it's clear our involvement is we drew these things. We, we drew them and lettered them and colored them and made them. And that, uh brings to mind the, the whole uh, model that one follows, you create the uh, product or the, the result, and then you have an installation that goes with it. That's like a tried and true model to follow. Like I see here, yeah. Invisible mm -hmm. City, and then you have the subway, uh, uh, a supplemental thing going on. Yeah, the Invisible City project was, was always, uh, it was always going to be a comic book and then breaking that comic book into pieces and pushing it out into the subway. And, uh, you know, I spent, when I lived in New York, I lived in New York for 15 years. 
I spent a lot of time on the subways. I spent a lot of time reading those advertisements. I don't know if you've been on the New York City subway, but they have yeah. these very, very famous advertising. And, uh, and that always seemed like stardom to me, right? I yeah. always wanted, like, like my dream was to make something that would appear on the New York City subway system. And so, um, uh, and, and this did, and it was, it was uh, hilarious. It covered about a quarter of the New York City subway system for a period of months. Uh, just, yeah, super awesome. And this could, could still be done today. I mean, it, I mean, it really could. Yeah, I think that, uh, I think it's just a matter of what stories you want to tell and how you want to tell them. Uh, this book, Modern Masters, when I was a kid living in West Virginia, the, when there was a crossover comic book where one character came to another character's comic book, like whenever that happens, it happens all the time now, but, but when I was a kid, like it was rare or it seemed rare. And so crossovers, I don't know, always stuck in my memory. And so I had this dream of crossing the Museum of Modern Art in DC Comics. And that's, uh -huh. what, that's what this book actually is. This was actually published, printed by DC Comics and then sold from within a, um, a a newsstand that I fabricated within the museum space. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So you, as you're walking around the museum, looking at the artwork, you would come across this uh, news newspaper uh, stand that sold this comic book, and you could buy this comic book inside the museum. And I thought, like, finally, I've done it. Right? Like, I've I've, I've stuck the two things together in a way that will forever <laughs> change things. Of course, nobody noticed or cared and, and this work has disappeared from, you know, it, it went without a blip. I don't think, I think the things that I care about aren't the things that other people care about. That's just, the, well, that's just the nature of it. That's human, it's not, that's never gonna change. That's human nature. So you just, you love it while it's there, it's documented, it's, it's part of your legacy. Now, I, I came across one of your comics many years ago. I think it was like maybe circa 2001 or so, or 2002. I don't remember. It was one of the uh, ones you did. And uh, I think I, I bought it at Seattle Art Museum. So I thought that was funny, buying a comic in an art museum. And back then in the early aughts, comics and museums did not really mix that much. No, it was radical. I actually remember that project. That was a book that we did. It was intended as a collaboration with Cindy Sherman, hmm. uh, the uh, the artist, and she had a big exhibition there. And then our book was a smaller sort of secondary exhibition that sort of was meant to sort of uh, invigorate her show as well. And um, uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, I think it was fine. I think it was okay. It was fun to do, you know, and, and, and I get to spend some time in Seattle, which was nice. And here's another example of the uh, comic and then the installation. This one really intrigues me. Could you chat a little bit about this one? Yeah, so this is um, uh, the Hatton Gallery in the UK. Um, most museums aren't called museums, they're called galleries. So this was actually the Hatton Museum and the way we think about it. Gallery here, one thinks of like, you know, commercial establishment, but this was a, this was a, um, a space that had a collection and they gave us sort of uh, carte blanche to do whatever we wanted to. So we made a comic book involving folks around the museum and then we took elements from the comic and really just went sort of nuts with um, the themes that we painted. And then also they let us use the collection as raw material. And so we kind of uh, hung works in ways that, that weren't, they weren't meant to be hung like that, which is kind of remarkable when they let you do that. Well, that, that's just amazing when you have that opportunity, you have the space, you have the budget, and you're let, you're let loose. Yeah, 
yeah i mean it's it's uh it's also you know that there's no guarantee that any of it'll work and so it's amazing that an institution would let you screw around like that like i mean we think it's going to work we think it's going to be okay but you don't know you know eighty thousand square feet is a lot of room to go wrong and this was well before you uh became a, a professor before you were just yeah, I, you were just an artist, right? At that at this point. Yeah, I was still living in New York, and um, uh, and yeah, I I uh, I think I was doing a little bit of graduate advising in Chicago, flying back and forth between New York and Chicago. Yeah. Well, this is going to be like a, a little mini uh, master's course for for artists, because I know that that's the big, big, big question: Do I go on to get a master's degree, and then? What do you really get from a master's degree? And from my observation, is well, it's an investment. You, it's a, it's a lab, so you just, you just treat it as a lab, and you get your credentials. And I guess that's the most valuable thing, isn't it? You get the, the credentials. I think graduate school gave me everything. You know, I had really? a good, I, yeah, I had a good undergraduate education. I'm, you know, like I speak to my uh, uh, former professors on a daily basis we're part of a chat chain oh that's great so i'm you know we're constantly in touch with my undergraduate professors my graduate school professors not so much but you know that graduate school experience it's crucible you know they really i was forged in fire you uh, -huh. uh, uh we we were on the quarter system and each quarter you had to stand up at the end of the quarter and defend what you were making to sometimes as many as 45 people and uh -huh. uh, and you sank or you swam. You know, you you could you either articulated what your work was about and your work did that thing, or uh, or it didn't. And then and then the knives would come out. Uh, and also the relationships I met Brennan in graduate school, and and I uh, I got to experience Chicago for four years, which was wonderful. I I think. Um, and, you know, like it was a state university, University of Illinois in Chicago, uh, so they had graduate stipends, so I didn't actually ever pay tuition to go to graduate school. Oh my God. I paid fees, and there are a lot of great state universities all over the country that have good faculty, great facilities. It's just the luck of the draw. I think more of the students that you get in there with is is more uh and it's random right like whoever shows up is whoever shows up and there's no programming you can't you can't manipulate that in any way. oh so yeah i think graduate school it, for me it it uh it set me on a path i loved it and i recommend it to my students you know if you want to be an artist uh, why not take two more years and let somebody pay you to go to school and meet all sorts of great people? Well, that's my, uh, I guess, kind of a regret because I, I did want to do it, but uh, there were a number of factors working against it. And uh, and then I had just had to jump into the job market. So I, and I just, it was like, once you're in the job market, day-to-day, -to -day, day job situation, you're not the type of person who's considering the stock market you're not the type of person who's considering grad school necessarily but um and i know older students go in so i i kind of thought well maybe i could come back to it but um uh, yeah you absolutely can and you absolutely should if it's something you love i i i you know everybody's experience is going to be different um i was i was lucky yeah it well was, I'm, i it's nice to hear that from you um now here's the whole bunch right here. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, I, I think this is just a wonderful. Did you just get to a point where you wanted to take a break from it? Or you, do you think, I mean, you've, you're kind of branching out in a whole new direction all, all of your own now with uh, Pinko Joe and Greeny Josephini. Do you see a thread running through from this to what you're doing now? Well, I thought that that these books these older books that I did with Brennan were changing the world and they weren't. <laughs> and so, 
And so that was my goal was to change the world. <laughs> it didn't, didn't work out. Um, and uh, I think the thing that changed for me is, you know, I, I, um, uh, I took this job at Rice University and, um, excuse me, and I got, I got tenured. And when I, when I got tenured, I, I, which is, you know, job for life, unless I commit a felony, you know, it's a good, it's, it's a, it's a good job to have. Oh, sure. Um, uh, and I spent about three months sort of lying in bed with the blankets over my head, just sort of uh, miserable. Like, oh, like I'm tenured now, I'm dead. Like what about, what, you know, there's nothing left for me. And then, <laughs> and then nobody tells you about post-tenure depression. But once I got over my post-tenure depression, then I realized that I could do anything I wanted to do. Nobody could say anything to me about it. And so um, one day, you know, I've been looking at, at uh, public domain comic books for a long time. And one day the idea just hit me, uh, which is sad that it took me so long for this idea to hit me because it's a pretty obvious. One. And I just started working on Pico Joe. Yeah. Well, it sounds like uh, life can just be a bunch of leaps of faith and one little project leads to another project. You just never know. I really love these. This is just a lot of fun stuff. It, it seems like you, once you got going in, in that era around 2005, 2006, you were like, you were doing really well there. And you, you all this European stuff going on too. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the, uh, all of this though is the dividend of that chocolate bar project. That chocolate bar project, um, made us kind of infamous. You know, we weren't, we weren't famous necessarily. We were a little bit notorious. And so the opportunity, we, opportunities uh, uh, just came our way. Oh, we really love the chocolate bar project. We'd love you to do something here. We love the chocolate bar project. We'd love you to do something there. Uh, and so it was really terrific. You know, I, I, we didn't really have to struggle to get uh, get these opportunities, and you know the work that we made, uh, like I I really enjoyed this Soy Madrid project. It's fairly toothless in terms of you know it's not politically minded at all, but uh, but still lovely to do uh, to to do work in Spain, just tremendous. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot to be said for, for doing the work that's not political. You don't take a stand either way. You just celebrate people. Here's another one of your, uh, this is from London again, or uh, in England, Sussex, Sussex Galleries. The Brighton Museum. And then uh, the whole thing with, uh, with Artstar, I managed to find a clip of it, which was really funny. Uh, this one girl was very, very snarky. That might be the only surviving easy to find clip, but uh, now this one seems like it was something that maybe you guys were thinking, oh, there might be a way to, to turn this into a franchise. Maybe there's some money to be made or, or what's the story behind it? Well, um, uh, in the late nineties, uh, Abby Turkuli, who was a executive producer over uh, MTV Animation, saw our comic books and invited me in and basically gave me a little development deal. And so I spent four years, sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, basically making pilots for animated shows that never got made, never went into production. And so after Abby left, uh, after they, they closed MTV Animation, which was, you know, really awful thing to do, because uh, uh, it was really tremendous uh, enterprise. Uh, Abby invited me to continue pitching ideas with him, and so I, I continued to come up with ideas for TV shows. Of course, uh, in the like 2004, 2005, the only thing anybody wanted was some kind of reality show. And so I came up with an idea for a reality show 
um, that was basically just a ripoff of American Idol. <laughs> uh, because, I, you know, I, I, I felt like the real art world is never seen, right? Like the struggle yeah. that artists go through is invisible. You yeah. know, you see the, the glamour and the parties and you see the, the high dollar signs for the sale of work, but you never see sort of like just the, the daily grind of what it takes to sort of enter the process. So uh, I, I felt like it was a good, it was a good effort to try to do that. And so it got picked up, it, um, it got uh, picked up for two seasons. We did two seasons and then 2008, the, the market collapsed and, and that it took, you know, it took so many things out with it. And one of them it took was a third season of Art Star. Is it available uh, anywhere? Can you get you know, the three seasons? It's um, it was showing on Ovation for a while. Oh, I see it come up on there every once in a while. You know, there isn't a lot of of serial arts programming, and so it, I think it's probably too old now to get. It's been you know what fifteen years or whatever. Um, well, uh, not to go down too much further on that, we, we have, we'll move on to here, the conflict theory, which I think is a really intriguing uh, installation piece. And I, I watched a little movie um, accompaniment to it. And it's funny because there's uh, some uh, very uh, spooky comments that are made because this is 2010. And, and you, I think you say at some point, well, this is Ann Arbor, not, not Ann Arbor, the idea is you create a war zone, you have your uh, participants in a war zone that's actually their hometown, so it makes them rethink war. And you say, well, this isn't an insurrection. It's, oh, good. <laughs> that's very uh, uh, interesting that you'd say that. And then the pieces are, are black and white, which, of course, that's relevant today. Uh, what can you, what would you like to share about that with us, this, this project? Well, this was fun. I was invited to spend uh, a semester as an artist uh, at the University of Mich Michigan's uh, art school. And I was, it's basically a kind of fishbowl type experience where the doors are open and people can, can come in and out as I'm working to develop an artwork. And um, I'm uh, growing up, of course, in the 70s, uh, Dungeons and Dragons and all these sort of paper and maps and dice games are, you know, in baked into my DNA. I love, I don't play games, but I love games. Uh, and so I knew that I wanted to make a game. Um, and I knew that I wanted to make a game about civil unrest. And so they have marvelous facilities there. And I got a bunch of students and people from outside the school involved. And we made a giant sort of, um, war game, like very old fashioned in a way um, with uh, chess like figures. So there's a, you know, white side and a black side um, and then sort of the neutral gray uh, of the game board. Uh, it was a lot of fun and uh, the game is, is interesting. I think it's, it's, uh, it's not that unique but then giving it that local character all those buildings you see are local buildings in Ann Arbor that the students make. And when you do a project like this, does it, is it something that just had its time and place and you move on or, or would you ever revisit a project? Um, well, I think like in the new mini comic that I made, I made a little board game in the sort of center spread. Oh, that's uh, okay. And, uh, and it's a save, race to save democracy game. Uh, and I made it on, uh, I started making the game on January 7th. <laughs> um, and I knew that, I, I just knew that I had, um, I had to say something about the insurrection. And so turning it into a board game seemed like a good idea to me. I don't, you know, you do things, you don't know why you do them or. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
There we go. Here, this is really uh, close to my heart. I, I'm Mexican American and, and a, a cartoonist, and so this is wonderful. Did you get a copy of this? I, I didn't get a copy of this one. If you email me your mailing address, I'll send you. Oh well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Yeah, this is uh, uh, this turned out really. I think it turned out really great. It's mostly. Um, uh, facsimile. So I love the facsimile comic books. I don't, you know, the, the like IDW puts out. Have you ever seen those? The, oh, yeah. The giant oversized. So this is a, um, and I love those. So I wanted to make one. And luckily, the, the original art uh, is this size. You know, oh. I didn't have to make a giant book. Oh, that's great. Yeah, the original uh, Mexican comic art is tiny. This is this is the art for a complete book. Oh wow! Uh, uh, and just uh, you know, here's a ruler for comparison, right? It's uh, five inches wide, and these are this is a stack of ninety six, you know, ink on paper drawings. Oh, and I, I think I remember now you saying uh, on another video that that you found these. At a, at a... Well, I was in uh, I was in a, a comic book store, or no, I was in a bookstore in Mexico City, and I found these little comic books. Have you ever seen these? No, that's wonderful. No, I haven't. So these are um, little black and white comic books that were made in the 1960s through the mid 1970s, and they're you know, they're, they have a little spine, they're perfect bound, and they were made, um, they made a lot of them. You know, I think um, there was a new one that appeared every week, right? And there were something like 26 publishing companies in Mexico by the mid 70s. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of the, Mexican comic history is just incredible. And there really isn't a lot that's said about it, which is uh, perplexing to me. So I fell into, um, I ran into a dealer, he had these things and he sold them to me for a dollar a page, the original mm. art. And he had the complete art for 15 books. Wow. Right, not just a page from a book, but the entire thing. And I thought, you know, I don't speak Spanish, I'm not Mexican, but by God, I'm an artist and a human being. And yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna take these things and I'm gonna hold them until somebody more qualified comes along and can take them and you know and do what's right for them. Yeah. And so that's what I've done is I've got uh, I've got them uh, uh, tucked away um, and just, uh, you know, I, so I published this uh, uh, Julio Camarena Perez, but he goes by Camarena as his, uses his middle name as his last name. Uh, just a tremendous talent, amazing. I think a, an amazing artist. I, I would challenge you, you know, maybe a few of the artists working at Marvel Maybe a couple of the Italian comic book artists, but but he's uh, churning these comics out at an incredible rate in the late '60s, early '70s. And so I I uh, I found some funding at the university, and I thought, you know, right, we're just gonna publish a book about about Camarena, and so that's what we did. Well, that's mind blowing. I, I, that is a major thing that you've just done. And here's a little piece of uh, the installation or, or. Yeah, so before we published the book, I did, um, I did an exhibition. Um, I previewed it in Berlin. I, I, I was an artist in residence at a little artist residency space called Somos in Berlin and did a, a little preview exhibition there. Took 25 works with me in my suitcase. You know, they were, were tiny. Um, and then this is uh, the installation here in Houston. 
uh, at Lawndale Art Center, which is a tremendous uh, sort of uh, uh, heavily, heavily involves artists in their exhibitions. Um, and then the, the show traveled to Chicago to uh, a place called the Glass Curtain Gallery. And we did an exhibition there. And then after that exhibition, I thought, you know, right, I need to preserve, preserve this. So a book. Well, I, I barely remember Lawndale. I, I lived in Houston many years. I went to the University of Houston and then oh, shit. then I, I just flew out, of, flew out of there and went to Seattle. I, I don't regret Seattle, the, the, the major move. Uh, it's just such a change of pace. But now I'm at a, a stage where I want to do another change of pace. And here's more recent work, of course, Pinko Joe. Um, yeah. Yes. What would you like to say about uh, wh where you're at now with Pinko Joe and Greeny Josephini? Well, I, you know, I think um, I'm pretty happy with both books. So Pinko Joe came out last year, uh, right at the start of the pandemic. So really great timing in terms of publishing and promotion. You know, nobody wanted to talk about anything else. So it, it kind of, I don't want to say it fell flat, but it just, it really just didn't, um, it didn't find the audience that I hoped it would find. Uh, and uh, of course then Greeny Josephini is the, is the sequel. Um, it was, I've always planned it as three books. So there's a third book that'll come out uh, this time next year, uh, God willing. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the, you know, it just sort of me chasing this sort of idea I have about comics making now, um, uh, you know, around the tree a couple of times. Well, yeah, we definitely, I, I already have an intro that, that shows off Greeny Josephini and I'll make it easy for people to see the review I did. And I think it's a book that uh, would be of, um, of interest appealing to anyone. Uh, I, I, I see it as something that's very uh, appealing to art students, uh, uh, serious thinkers about comics, but it, of course it could also have broad appeal. I tried to make sure, that's one thing I learned at MTV, I don't know that I applied all the time, is that, that there really needs to be a laugh on every page. And if there isn't a laugh on every page, then you need to go back and write some more jokes or you, know, you need to think about the humor. I don't know if you laughed at all while you're, you're oh, reading yeah. it. That's good. That's a that's good. <laughs> no. no, no, absolutely. You you get in, you figure out the, the type of humor it is, and, and it, the the tone is established on page one, and you just run with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's potentially offensive. I don't think it's offensive, but uh, I think people are always. Um, I think it, it worries some people, the humor in the book. It's a little dangerous, I think. Well, I don't know what to say about that because I don't think we, sh we should be feeling uh, threatened by uh, certain people or certain uh, entities out there, yeah. extreme right folks that, because the whole thing with uh, Mr. T there was that there was this implied threat that if you say something bad things are going to happen. Well, no. Yeah. yeah. But anyhow, this, ah. this little book. <laughs> That's a nice one, isn't it? It's a very nice one. And, and that whole idea of doing, uh, doing this format. Yeah. It invites you to just sit down and, and read the whole thing in one sitting. Yeah. It's chock full of information, very inspiring. Makes you just want to go out there and create some art. Well, that's 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 a great compliment. That's that's really uh, that's really nice to hear. Yeah, uh, I had. Uh, it's a weird book. I don't know that there are many books like this. I, I guess that's kind of my jam is I make things that I don't think anybody else would make I, <laughs> for whatever reason. But uh, yeah, I mean the the um, there's some essays, there's some tutorials, there's some art history, uh, it, and it's over pretty quick. Yeah. 
Well, oh, you know, maybe you could say a little bit about Jackson because that was quite an interesting uh, thing you got to do. It went to Anglomé uh, last year, I think. Yeah, so um, a colleague of mine, Brian Huberman, he's uh, in my department. We have uh, uh, filmmaking and photography as well as studio art and theater. So it's really, uh, it's really a small, really diverse uh, uh, department. And he'd been telling me for a couple of years, you know, I shot this film with Jack Jackson. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, okay, Brian, whatever. <laughs> and then one day I thought, wait, Jack Jackson? <laughs> like, like, the Jack Jackson? What are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, this, this uh, cartoonist. And I said, you know, how close is that done to being done? Like you, you shot it 20 years ago. Um, I said, you can finish that film. He said, well, I've got about 20 minutes put together. And I said, 20 minutes is great. Let's, let's take that film to Angolan. You know, I'll get, I'll get it to be part of the official program and, and we'll go to France and we'll show your film and we'll talk about it. Um, and so then he, he basically sat down and added 40 minutes to the film. He edited the crap out of it. Like, like I thought like, okay, man, like, stop making this film longer like we, we got to oh, take yeah. it on the road yeah um but finally he stopped and we got it uh over um a, about a, we had about a month he stopped about a month before we had to go to Angolan and we got it subtitled and professionally uh sort of rigged up so it could play and and yeah we took to Angolan and and screened it and um had a great time I really recommend. Have you been to Angolan before? I am going to go eventually. Yeah, I've, I've been meaning to. Um, it's a zoo. It is crazy. Um, but the thing that I found heartening, you know, I wasn't there to try to sell comics or to try to get a publisher. I was just there to show this film and then look around. And so it was wonderful. You know, in France, they have such a different idea about comics than we do. Yeah. And so it was a, this giant comic book festival, and there was no cosplay. <laughs> well, it's more a way of life. Yeah, yeah. And the people that were in line, they looked like the people in line at the grocery store, right? Like there was no, there, there wasn't this uh, sort of veil of sadness over like like a like everyone's embarrassed to be there or something they were happy to be there no and it, I, I was in paris uh, in 2018 and uh for some reason we had to go to uh do something practical so we ended up going to something like a target in paris and they had a whole uh nice display more than one of graphic novels that you, you see graphic novels in, in your target here in the u.s no but maybe you should and, and they weren't superheroes, they were slice of life's work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wish I spoke French because there's tremendous, tremendous work being made in France. I wish I spoke Spanish. There's tremendous work being made in, uh, in Mexico. Um, maybe if I spoke Japanese, I would like manga better. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I feel um, a little imprisoned dependent, depending on, on translations in order to really enjoy, uh, I mean, that's the, that's the, the shortcoming of comics, I guess. Like a painting, you can enjoy a painting without speaking the language, but a comic book, you really need, really need that, that language. Well, uh, that makes me think of uh, Vanagraphics and all the, the wonderful work they've done in translating work, like uh, the work of Tardy, for instance. Yeah, I, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I there's, uh, you know, I've been focused on getting these books out, and so my attention for what other people are producing is is minimal. I, I, you know, it's it's hard to be making all the time and looking at stuff all the time, and so I, I. Maybe when the third volume uh, comes out, then I can take a vacation and read some comic books.
folks. Well, I I just want to make sure every and I I've already there's lots of intros and stuff going on about letting people know about Greeny Josephini and and cats at Rice University. Fundamental of course, Camarena. Of course, you're the nice thing about Camarena, the Camarena book is it's in English and Spanish. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, uh, every every word that's in English is also in here in Spanish. So it's it's a fully uh, you know, it was, uh, um, was not translated by me, which I think, you know, that's where I fall down as like a proper academic, right? A, prop, a proper academic would have translated their own material. I I I, you can't do everything, but uh, <laughs> that's nice that you could use that as a teaching tool to learn Spanish because everything helps along the way. Yeah, absolutely. And then you've got all your stuff on Instagram. Of course, people need to be aware of that. That at Pinko Joe. At Pinko underscore Joe, which okay. you know, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, the Instagram stuff has been sort of the, the way that I've survived uh, being on my own for a year. You know, like like a desert island kind of uh, experience. And uh, now that I. Now I've been doing it for a year and now it's habitual. Like if I don't do it, if I don't make a drawing every day, I feel like uh, I'm letting myself down or something. I should exercise more and draw less, but uh, I just, I, I have that reversed. I, I don't get enough exercise, but I draw like a mother. <laughs> well, it's, it sounds like you got it just right in, in your routine and so, Cool. I, I think that's wonderful. I think we've covered everything. Argo, Argo Books, of course, that's where you get, you get these books from. And yeah. are there other outlets you could get them from as well, or just go to Argo Bargo? I, uh, I think just go to Argo Bargo. You know, I, I, um, I've thrown away the idea of trying to uh, do anything with Amazon. I, I, I think that that that's that's just bad news um yeah and and buying it online seems to be easy enough right everybody yeah. buys everything online just this is where you buy it from yeah the, the days of distribution are kind of gone right yeah uh, yeah so yeah okay Marvel, marvelbooks.com it's the name just rolls off the tongue it's such a great once you hear it, you can't forget it. ArgoBargoBooks.com. So well, and, and I'll plug the publisher as well, Stan Waney. He's a terrific artist in his own right. He's got yeah. a book coming out with uh, Conundrum Press, uh, I think, in the fall. Uh, it's uh, it's really a labor of love for him. Um, he just had uh, um, uh, Jonathan McBurney is the new book that's coming out from Argo Bargo in addition to mine. So. They're, um, you know, Stan is uh, uh, an amazing artist. And so, and so he's, I think he's got a great eye. It's such a pleasure to be a part of his, his uh, publishing venture. Well, yeah, I was very impressed with him. I, I saw you guys on a panel about protest art and it was featuring Sue Cohn. Yeah. yeah. Very good stuff. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. I, I really appreciate this. Sure thing. Yeah. Happy, happy to be here.